The next topic in PET-CT is creating protocols that will optimize the accuracy of PET-CT in diagnosing patients. For the PET itself, the patient needs to fast for six hours prior to the examination. Blood glucose levels are critical, especially in diabetics, but we measure blood glucose levels in everybody because high blood glucose levels results in competition between the fluorodeoxoglucose and the native glucose, and that competition will produce poor images. Uh, exogenous insulin is a problem because it will drive the glucose and the fluorodeoxyglucose into the muscles, and that also decreases the quality of the images, so diabetics don't get to use their insulin uh, on the morning of the examination. It, patients who have blood glucose levels that are too high are rescheduled for another date. We deliver between 14 and 18 millicuries of 18 FFDG. We allow one hour for the FTG to be taken up by the cells, then we perform the CT, and then we perform the PET examination. It's important that the patients not move or talk during the uptake phase, uh, but they, they always talk. It's an unrealistic expectation for your patients not to be talking for an hour, uh, and that's why we have normal, what we consider normal physiologic uptake within the larynx. This is what happens if the patient has elevated blood glucose. You can see that there is tremendous competition for the glucose across all of the soft tissues, and you just get this hazy blur of an image where you can't even make out the major organs that concentrate FDG physiologically. This is the exact same patient uh, at a different, a different day when he had a normal glucose level, and you can see what the distinction between soft tissues is supposed to look like. As for the CT, we like two to three millimeter slice thickness throughout the entire body. Uh, we perform imaging of the neck with the arms at the sides, not overhead for head and neck cancers. Uh, we use a narrow field of view for the neck, and we want imaging that includes high resolution lung parenchyma. Let me dive into this a little more deeply. The bottom line here is we need optimal imaging of the neck and optical, optimal imaging of the chest. We need the arms up when we're imaging the chest. We need the arms down when we're imaging the neck so that the humerus is not getting in the way in either of those circumstances. We need a small field of view for the neck relative to the large field of view that's necessary for the chest. The only way to accomplish this, this is to perform two acquisitions with two different arm positions. Now you can do this in a couple of different ways. You can do a full body image with the arms up, thus getting good images of the chest, and then redo uh, the neck portion with the arms down and with a smaller field of view. Or you can do full body imaging with the arms down, then redo a breath hold chest with the arms up and then reconstruct the neck images to a smaller field of view based on those full body images. We actually do the second of these at my institution. I mean, you can, these are two ways to skin a cat, but we do the second one at my institution because we like the idea of a breath hold, high resolution chest CT. The inclusion of the abdomen and pelvis for head and neck cancer is controversial. The answer of whether to include it depends on histopathology. For most squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck, there is no abdominal pelvic metastatic disease until the chest has been affected. So uh, if there's no known chest disease, there's really no reason to image the abdomen and pelvis. But there are some other situations. For example, HPV positive squamous cell carcinoma has been shown to have some unusual patterns of spread and may show up with distant metastases in strange places. So you could argue for a staging that includes the abdomen and pelvis in HPV positive squamous cell carcinoma. Other histopathologies, follicular thyroid cancer, which is known for its bony metastases, melanoma, which is known for doing whatever it wants. Those are situations where the abdomen and pelvis, and in fact, the lower extremities, uh, can be reasonably included. Similarly, the inclusion of a head is controversial, and it depends on the location of the primary tumor. Metastatic disease to the brain from squamous cell carcinoma of the 
head and neck is exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare, until the patient is overwhelmed with metastatic disease. Now, if you have a primary tumor that is up against the skull base and you need to look for a direct invasion of the skull base, then it's perfectly reasonable to include a head. Um, although, honestly, in those situations, we, we use PET-MR instead of PET-CT. This is the most important topic. It's the use of intravenous contrast. When you use intravenous iodinated contrast, you get marked improvement in the quality of the CT images. There are, in theory, potential artifacts because the contrast doesn't stick around uh, for very long, and so you may image with the contrast in one place, but the FDG acquisition has the contrast more diffusely dispersed. Uh, it turns out that those are not realistic problems. Um, there, I think, are billing issues that are probably the main reason why people don't use intravenous contrast. Um, sometimes patients have had a recent diagnostic CT and, uh, and the insurance doesn't want to pay for another iodinated uh, contrast scan. I think the most common reason for not using IV contrast, unfortunately, is that the people who are interpreting these studies don't often have the expertise to read the CT of the neck and thus prefer not to have that even included in the examination. This is a, a poor reason not to serve the patients well, but I think that is often a driving force. But my number one take home point, I mean, if you take anything away from this micro lecture, it is that intravenous contrast improves the quality of PET CT. Use it whenever possible for head and neck cancer. Now, this is an example of a patient who has some muscular uptake in the neck, and um, this is an unknown primary. There's really nothing about the PET. Uh, uh, or, or the contour on CT that would indicate either one of these tonsils as particularly interesting. But on post-contrast imaging, you can see the rounded focus of tumor that is in fact the primary tumor in this oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. It is only with IV contrast that we'd ever have been able to pick that up. Here's another example where intravenous contrast was particularly useful. This is a very complex uh, PET-CT. Uh, this is a huge pseudocyst, and we're seeing a little bit of bleed out from the brain parenchyma into the pseudocyst. There's muscular uptake. There's something going on, probably muscular uptake in the, uh, in the uh, paraspinal musculature there. Now, this is a really messy scan and hard to interpret. But here is what the contrast-enhanced CT that accompanied this PET looks like. There is a rim-enhancing lesion right where this FDG uptake is. That is a metastasis. That's a retropharyngeal lymph node. It is metastatic disease, and it was critical to the staging of this patient. There is maybe, maybe you would have looked at this on, on an unenhanced scan and said that's suspicious. But in the setting of all the other muscular uptake, I think I would not have. I think I would have attributed this to muscular uptake, but it is, in fact, cancer. You can only definitively pick it up on this contrast-enhanced CT. This is a sad case where the lack of intravenous contrast really hurt a patient. Um, this area of FDG avidity uh, very near the surgical bed in this patient was interpreted as post-surgical healing tissue or physiologic uptake from the muscle in the tongue, and uh, it was blown off. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think that if we had had intravenous contrast on this examination, there would have been something worth seeing here. I, I'll never know because we didn't give contrast in this patient until several months later. And this is what it looked like several months later. There's a clear, unequivocal uh, recurrence in that location. So um, an, just another example where the use of intravenous contrast, I believe, would have really changed the course of this patient's care. So we've talked about uh, how PET-CT works, and we've talked about how to optimize acquisition protocols for PET-CT. Uh, next, we'll talk about uses of PET-CT in head and neck cancer.